So we're going to be answering your questions. Actually, Justin's going to be answering your questions all about exams. Now, Justin, uh, you are or you have been an examiner. Yeah, so cur currently principal examiner for a paper transitioning to another one. Uh, but this past week I have been editing a mark scheme based on student responses. So you've seen the questions in advance, you've come up with some of the questions? Yeah, I've. Uh, so this paper that I'm currently principal examiner on, I've written over 50% of those questions and in previous years I wrote the whole paper. Okay, and so that means you've got a good understanding of what kind of things come up and I guess uh, the questions that we put out, and we, we put this out just on YouTube just a few minutes ago, um, I've got some questions from people that it would be great to ask you about. Now, yeah. this isn't specific to any particular exam board, so we're not doing this AQA, EdXL, OCR. It's just a general kind of, with a bit of sort of inside, inside the help, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, so, so what I would do in these situations, yeah. I suppose. Okay, uh, the first one is, what if your answer is right, but it's not included in the marking scheme? Okay, so there are various degrees of correctness. So okay. an example might be, uh, name a source of background radiation. Yeah. And if you look at the pie chart, the only time you see a pie chart in physics, mm -hmm. uh, you'll see there's a tiny slither there about like nuclear testing or, you know, medical stuff. Yeah. So technically it's correct, mm -hmm. but there's bigger and better answers. There's cosmic rays, there's radon, there's food and drink. Yeah. These are the things that, you know, you're expected to say. Mm -hmm. So when there's multiple answers, go for one of the main ones. Okay, so That's, try not to be too clever to be like, well, I know all about this thing, but actually yeah. cosmic radiation probably is going to get you the, the mark, so the guaranteed mark if it's, if it's that kind of thing. Yeah, so, so when people are writing a mark scheme, there's what they expect you to answer, and not everybody who's marking it is going to be an absolute expert on everything that's in that paper. Yeah. So to ensure consistency amongst markers and standardisation, they will come up with a list of maybe three or four alternatives that are you know, the main alternatives, and if you've got those, that's fine. If you put in something that the examiner who's marking it thinks, oh, this is valid and should maybe be included, they can ask up the chain to the team leader and then to the principal examiner who can make those decisions for them. And does the mark scheme change, or is it fixed in stone once the questions have actually been written? So the mark scheme changes up until the point at the end of what's called the standardization meeting. Yeah. So that's where the principal examiner and the team leaders will get together. They'll look at maybe 20 papers to see what people have actually written. Yeah. And quite often at that point, they'll see that the students have interpreted things slightly differently or maybe a question was ambiguous that the you know, setters and vetters who checked it before didn't pick up on and if they feel that that's the case then they can come up with a couple of alternative solutions and say if they've interpreted the question this way this is what we expect but if they've misinterpreted it mm -hmm. because it was slightly ambiguous then this method is also allowed that's so they can come up with alternatives okay yeah. so it's done in like a very logical grown-up approach yeah the, the problem is if somebody later on and wasn't in that initial selection of the first 20 or so that were selected, Yeah. Uh, outside that meeting, then it's quite hard to make those changes retrospectively. Sometimes it can happen if you've got a small team. Yeah. You can just say, oh, just on this question, can you go back mm -hmm. and double check? Nobody's done that. But when it's a larger paper with thousands of people sitting it, mm -hmm. then you really want to get it finalised 100% at that meeting. Cool, okay. Uh, the next one is, uh, how do you deal with different subjects having different definitions for the same terms? So, so potentially there might be somebody doing A-level chemistry and A-level physics. Um, there might be a similar term used. Does it matter too much on the exact wording for definitions? So obviously I'm going to be you know, expecting the physics definitions. The example that you've just triggered with uh, talking about chemistry is when we're talking about ideal gases and the collisions that the particles have. Yeah. Quite often I'll see this term about there being successful collisions, which I think is a chemistry term yes. about a reaction. Yeah. Uh, so if they say that, um, if that successful doesn't isn't important, I would just mm -hmm. ignore it. Yeah. But if they've replaced kind of a key terminology that I'm looking for with something else that means something different, 
then that could be problems. So quite often, uh, if they're talking about something being larger, mm -hmm. does that mean it's more massive or are they talking about volume? So things like that, you really got to be specific with your wording because that terminology, I mean, larger is larger. Mm. But from the context, can you tell always? Not necessarily. But often within mark schemes from past papers, it's often certain keywords are underlined and they're like the essential words that you need in some definitions. Yeah. So, for example, if you're talking about nuclear fusion, you need to talk about the nucleus or nuclei rather than atoms. Yeah. So, there, there's, yeah, the keywords are very important. Okay, cool. Uh, the next one is about significant figures. Uh, it's about any marks being deducted on exams due to significant figures. Uh, it happens. It's one of my main bugbears. Mm -hmm. um, as, as an examiner, I want to be positive and I want to reward good understanding and good physics. But part yeah. of physics is about understanding why significant figures are important. Mm -hmm. So usually there will be one, possibly two, depends whether it's like a practical or an uncertainty question, then there's more scope for significant figures being uh, assessed on a particular question. Yeah. Uh, so there will be a particular question, and normally it will say, give your answer to an appropriate number of sig figs okay. as a nice warning. But really, all of your answers should be given to an appropriate number of sig figs. Mm -hmm. So on a paper, you might lose one or two marks if you're just writing down everything your calculator gives you. But if you're doing three papers, and that's your approach, you could be losing five or six marks in total. But I would have thought that for most students, by the time you get to your final exams in year 13 you're not going to be writing down, you know, 84.825672. You're going to th kind of think about what's an appropriate number to give that to. And I think that will come as well as you're doing more past papers. It should do, <laughs> it should do. but it's not always explicitly taught as, you know, the rules are taught yeah. about, you know, if I'm adding or dividing, or sorry, adding or subtracting, multiplying or dividing, is it sig figs, is it decimal places, that's important. Uh, but the understanding be behind why we have those rules Mm -hmm. is often what's missing. So if students understood that, and that's something that I will be going over in one of the first lessons on uh, the course that I'm running, yeah. um, then that will really help. And also, sig figs is the number one complaint I've had from students trying to use Isaac Physics. I can understand that. Uh, and if you want to find out more about Justin's course, there's more details underneath the video. Right, the next question. Yeah. Uh, what happens if you get the correct answer, but with no working out? Okay. Always show your working. Mm -hmm. So the first year I started marking exam papers, um, there were two students, and I could tell they were equivalent from their written answers. Okay. You know, the describe, explain stuff. Yeah, the, these guys were basically the same. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were two five-mark questions, and both of them made essentially the same mistake. It was a power of ten mistake. Yeah. Uh, one of them showed their full working. And because I could see that, I could apply error carried forward, and I gave them four out of five both times. The other person didn't show any working whatsoever, but they wrote down the same wrong answer. I kind of knew what it was, but I'm not allowed to give them error carried forward if they've not shown their working. Yeah. So there was an eight mark difference between these two candidates who, in my opinion, were equally, should have been equally uh, able, and that's the difference between a B and an A star. I guess, yeah, because it might be that they've done something similar on all three papers and that eight marks suddenly becomes 24 marks, which is a massive difference for, for grade boundaries. And it? it's, it's just ridiculous. They've, they've worked so hard for two years, but because they're being a little bit lazy, that's what's cost them in the end. Yep. Their first choice university, I don't know if they would have even made their insurance choice with that kind of grade drop. I've not actually answered your question fully here. Um, so that was, if they get the right answer with incorrect working yeah do they get the marks yeah so the other part of this is if you get the correct answer but it's incorrect working do you get any marks for that okay so if an exam question is well written mm -hmm. to get the correct answer there should be a very slight chance of you fluking it okay okay so uh you'll see in the mark schemes it will be written, you know, full answer, no working, gets full credit. Those, okay. those mark schemes aren't writ written for students. They're not written for teachers mm -hmm. using those exam papers as class tests, for example. Yeah. Those are written for the live examiners when the paper is just done. Mm -hmm. 
if I didn't put that in the exam and every single line had to be checked, the examiners would be on less than minimum wage. So normally they'll go, have they got the correct answer? That's the first thing they look at. Yeah. Okay, that's correct, four marks, and then they kind of move on. So unless they, it's something obviously like wrong with it. So if they've got the right answer, they get, say, four marks. It's only maybe if they haven't got the full correct answer that the the people marking it maybe go back in and try and look to where they can actually award marks for what has been achieved. Yeah. So, so one particular question that I was looking at this week, uh, I had it listed as kind of like C marks, which are the compensatory marks. Mm -hmm. So C1, C1, A1. So that basically means answer's correct. You check that, they get all three marks. Yeah. But we saw some scripts that were having the right answer, but they'd done it an incorrect method. So then we had to go back and change the mark scheme and say, ah, okay, we, we didn't anticipate that they would have done this method to get that answer. Mm -hmm. But a few people have. So now we've changed one of those C marks into a method mark. Even if they get the right answer, but the method is wrong, mm -hmm. they need to have that method mark to unlock the answer mark. Okay. So, yeah, correct answer there. We had to double check that the method was okay in order to give them those marks. I see. So if that comes up, and we spot it, then no, they shouldn't get four marks for a right answer if they've done it with wrong physics, basically. But I guess the most important thing is to have a good understanding of the physics, make sure that you know what could be coming up in the exam, and then I guess it's just plenty of practice. And I guess over time, the more practice you do, the higher chance you have of getting more marks on that paper, just because you're ticking more of the boxes and you're getting the right mark and you're, you're going to that exam confidently. It, it becomes a habit, showing full working, whatever yeah. you're doing, particularly if, if you've got some homework, try to make the model solution. So hmm. you don't have that time pressure then that you'd have in an exam. Yeah. Use this to build those good habits, draw your diagrams, state your equations, rearrange, substitute, appropriate sig figs, don't forget the unit people. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Justin, thank you much, so much for your advice. And I'm sure that uh, it's, it's going to be super useful for the people watching. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you again.